from the central coast of New South Wales, Australia, it's the number one podcast for the X-Men animated series. This is Generation X-Men with Bender and Brooksy. Yes, welcome back. Thanks, Steve. This is Generation X-Men. I'm Bender and with me as always is Brooksy. Hey, hey. Like the name suggests, we are Generation X-Men and you are too. If you're new to this, what we'll be doing is going through all five seasons of X-Men the Animated Series, one episode at a time, giving you our thoughts, X-Quiz, tally time, and most importantly, having a laugh as well. Now, whatever it takes, eh? Oh. Whatever it takes for you to sit through this one. Oh, I man. can tell you weren't vibing this one no. like you normally are, Brooksy. Not at all. I did not enjoy this. <laughs> As painful as a child, it still is now. Really painful as a child. Uh, see, see, uh, considering this is uh, considered a subpar episode, but uh, surprisingly, Kim and I watched this one a fair bit for some reason. Why? I couldn't tell you why. Maybe it was one of the few episodes I had recorded on tape, or right. it was at the start of a tape that you always had to watch when you rewinded the tape. I couldn't tell you why, but... Um, this is one of the episodes that Kim remembers most off the top of her head. If I say X-Men animated series, what can she tell me about it? She'll say Shadow King or Mijnari and even remember the name. Um, so I guess it would form the category of cheesy but entertaining for us, but maybe because we've got that nostalgia hook to it. Um, but from, uh, yeah, this is an odd episode because it's got the A and B storylines where the B storyline seems more interesting yeah. than the A storyline, <laughs> and that's uh, Wolverine and Morph. Uh, Wolverine's track and Morph Just down. tidying that up from last episode, really. Tidying it up, but sort of um, opening up different um, where he could be hiding. And you see Wolverine's like on a on a boat somewhere and it's deep in the jungle. And that, that's, to me... Why not make that the A mm. story? Because that's way more interesting. Wolverine by himself. Who cares what the other X Men are doing? I'd have a whole episode of him tracking him morph down like he's like a private investigator or a detective sort of thing. Have you seen this man? He might look like this, or he might look like this. You could have to track him down through his sense of humor alone. But anyway, also wanted to mention that I also should note that this episode was written by Julia Lee Ward. Yeah. We previously had a slam dunk mm. with Days of Future Past Part 1, which was, I would say, is flawlessly written. It's funny, badass, and all that sort of jazz. And this one, bit of a misfire in my opinion. I think it's just it's just the, the content. Like, it's it's right. what she's writing about. Okay. It's... So if, if she's got the... The, uh, but what are you really going to do with the Shadow King? You, like, you reckon they'd like draw ideas, put them up in a hat, and then the writers have yeah. to pull out of a hat and like, fuck Shadow King. <laughs> or fuck Morlocks. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Omega Red. <laughs> you know, I mean? I'd like to think that's how it happens, but oh yeah, that's a good point. But anyway, uh, let's not blabber on much longer. It's time for X-Quiz. Fuck quiz, Hotshot. Fuck quiz! Pop quiz, asshole. Time for a surprise quiz. Won't be a pop quiz on Wednesday. It's a pop quiz. Pop quiz. All right, what do you got? I only got a couple this time. Well, I've got two, B. Uh, how about I start then? All right. <laughs> Uh, what shirt is Mijinari wearing? <laughs> That's it. 23, Jordan, uh, Chicago Bulls. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> that was my first question, fuck. Uh, no. <laughs> but yeah, it was, it's a pretty, I imagine he was pretty big at that time, so everyone would be wearing yeah. the Jordan 23, whoop, whoop. And because uh, he's African, I guess they're considered a hero over there. But here, I've got one. I'm going to call him the Miz for short, instead of saying Mijinari. So the Miz, what colour are Miz's eyes? Ooh, uh, green. Yes, they are green. Yeah. I thought ma- I thought to make note of that because <laughs> Storm- yeah, yeah. You can't rent here no more. <laughs> You're not allowed to rent here anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Little clerks reference there because I mentioned Brooksy to that scene because it was on the other day, the other month. I just thought that scene was absolutely hilarious because Jay has no idea what's going on. <laughs> he just knows that someone's been banned. He's either backing up, what's his name, Randall? Uh, Dante. Oh, yeah, Randall. He's either, either backing up Randall or he's just giving shit to that lady for no <laughs> reason whatsoever. Either way, it's hilarious. Yeah. Kevin Smith's right never got any better than that. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, I meant to make note of uh, Ms. Nari's eyes because they're green and Storm's eyes are blues, just odd or really unique uh, eye colours. 
How about uh, what is the name of the boat captain's monkey? Ah, oh, I fucking had it, but I lost it. Is it? He has a peanut, but I don't think his name is Peanut. No. Nah. Wolverine tempts him with a peanut. Yes, and he gets him on the show. I've never seen him do that before. Uh, Kyle. No. <laughs> What's the monkey's name? Oh. Montgomery. Montgomery. Oh, I should, <laughs> knew it should have been British because he's an English sea captain. Hey, Montgomery. But, but, <laughs> nah, I liked it. Good. Yeah, I missed that one. You got another one? Nah, that's it. I only got the two. All right, the only one, the one that I grabbed was... Uh, when Mijnari starts playing soccer against two mates, yep. Mijnari's got like a yellow headband on. All right. And his other two mates had two other different colored ah, colors. headbands on. What colors are they? So Mijnari's is yellow. I'm going to say theirs were blue and green. Ooh, 50-50. Uh, blue yeah. and purple. Ah, purple. <laughs> always get done by that color. I was I was going to mention all the ex cameos, but chances are you had your eyes on them yeah, and written down in your notes anyway. I so. did have that one too. I just checked off on it whether you wanted to go through it or not. Nah, I, I, I know better than to do uh, ex cameos as <laughs> trivia because quiz because uh, you'll have it on lock anyway. Previously on X Men. So this is very uh, morph centric. The old this previous on X Men. Uh, we have the Morph slash Magneto lures Professor X to Antarctica. Yep. And then we got uh, Morph is alive and he wants revenge. <laughs> and then so he takes off in the X jet and then we see him land on the island. Mm-hmm. And then uh, Cyclops gets the old, keep away from my friends. <laughs> Stay away from my friends. <laughs> and then uh, Nail, Sinister. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Magneto and the Professor meet in Antarctica. And then the avalanche knocks him off the cliff. Mm-hmm. See, my biggest gripe with this episode already, no nasty boys. No. I need them. I need them again. <laughs> when nasty. Are they, nasty. When are they coming back? More gorgeous George, <laughs> please. I'm into him now. But yeah, that's the previously on uh, previously on X-Men, just covering the last two episodes uh, of the season. So far, Cyclops, Gene, still unmarried, married, whatever. Morph still crazy on the run. Wolverine's after him. Chaos. And uh, Professor X and Magneto lost. All right, it's time for the breakdown. Break it down. Break it down. Now it's time for a breakdown. Breakdown. Where is she? So today we are doing episode 16, season 2, episode 3, Whatever It Takes. Whatever It Takes. Uh, original air date for this one was November 6, 1993. And it was written by Julia Leewald and directed by Larry Houston. On you, Larry. Straight up, I think the title <laughs> the title of the episode, Whatever It Takes, mm. doesn't really um, connect with the story with go- what's going on. I, do you think it's more or less an uh, in-joke yeah, to the I, writer because whatever it takes, yeah. I'll, I'll do whatever it takes to get this episode That's the way out. I, I always <laughs> take it. <laughs> but yeah, I don't know what that means. You got anything else that it could be? I know whatever it takes to protect Mijnari or whatever. It's always like that. They're always protecting someone. Yeah, always protecting someone. It's just sort of one of those open sort of titles that doesn't really... I mean, it's not as good as, say, Till Death Do Us Part was got to do with a a marriage and and all this sort of thing and death and darkness. And coming up later, Red Dawn obviously connects to the the Soviet Union, Colour Red, Red Dawn, and it was about a, a movie about a Russian invasion. That makes sense to call an episode about a Russian mutant, but whatever it takes doesn't really have a strong connection to the material for me. So, yeah, just a point that I wanted to make. So the episode starts with uh, Mount Kilimanjaro in Africa. It's a cool name for a mountain. I just <laughs> want to lay that out. Kilimanjaro is fun to say. <laughs> it is the tallest mountain in Africa. Oh, very. I thought I'd just throw <laughs> that one in for you. So we're, we're learning as well. Yeah. We want to inform our... <laughs> what I have found with this podcast is you aren't too, isn't too good with uh, geography. Geography and history. Those lessons were just me at the back of the class mucking around with Corey. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I didn't listen. I... Well, it was maths where we were always talking football. Yeah. <laughs> well, you, you always seem to retain all that information i just just didn't go in oh we're talking about horror movies the horror movies i remember all that shit <laughs> <laughs> mass or geography wasn't important i'm not gonna go to mount kilimanjaro so we see a young boy running very fast mm-hmm. and it is mijnari a miz 
So Mijnari, who has the mutant power of superhuman speed. Mm. The classic, classic superpower. And he uh, meets up with his friends to play a bit of soccer. Mm-hmm. And yeah, again, <laughs> it's, it just starts off, I don't like soccer. And I'm like, oh, well, it starts off with soccer. Great. This it's is going to keep my attention str- even more. Starting strong for you. Oh. And then uh, so his, his mates are complaining about him using his speed because they think he's cheating, I guess. But no, they don't seem to. They're not too worried that he's mutant. Uh, they're just, I like that they're, 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 they're just cool with him having powers and everything, but don't cheat. Yeah. Don't use the powers when we're playing football or soccer, whatever you want to call it. It's all good that you have powers. That's cool. I like that bit. Accepting of him. So then we see like a bright light appear in front of them, and uh, Mijnari is worried that the mountain is blowing apart. Mm-hmm. And uh, his mates just look up the mountain and they can't see anything. Yeah, it's just him. His boys don't believe him. And we see this uh, yellow light then molds into sort of like a wolf face mm. with uh, big red eyes. And then uh, we cut away to the war room. Mm, already in the war room. Do you think that um, Mishnari also has like an, a secondary power of detecting tears in... Uh, dimensions and stuff like that because it's not explained anywhere else no. as to why he he's the only one who can see that yeah for me it makes sense that he he either has a an extra bit of power that he can see like rips in time or dimensions and that sort of thing but they really didn't explain that whether i think they should have you know yeah they like when they're cramming all the exposition into the last uh, last act right before it happens. They could have easily just slipped it in there, but uh, maybe maybe sub subtext or something for us to read into. Hmm. So in the war room, Jean's wearing cerebro, and she can sense something odd in that part of Africa. Mm. So that, yeah, it's it's Mount Kilimanjaro in Tanzania. That's that's where they. The issues coming from that she's found, mm, and it could be safe that she's on Cerebro searching for the pre- searching for the professor. That's right. And any sort of spike that pops up, she might think, "Oh, there he is," but it's not. So Rogue enters the room with Storm, mm-hmm. and uh, so she's brought home from the hospital. Mm. And uh, they're all surprised to see Storm. They think she should have been in hospital a bit longer, but the old uh, full power. From the, <laughs> from the gun she got hit, doesn't seem to worry her too much. No, no, she's coming in with a sort of a limp, her hands across her stomach yeah. like that. But uh, yeah, she, she's pretty tough. She can take it. So Rogue asks what's going on, and uh, Jean explains that they were doing a scan of the world looking for the professor, and she has come across this tear in the astral plane. So this is the first time it's mentioned the astral plane. That's when it's first mentioned, so that should be of note as well. Uh, Beast is quick to guess that it's Bishop's time travel is to cause. Yeah, well, it makes sense that that could have messed things up. And also, same writer. It's a call straight back to that. That's episode. right, Julia Lee. Well, so she would mention the bishop. That's that's a cool connection there. And uh, Storm sees the location and is immediately worried about Mishnari. Mishnari. Who she already knows. Yes. And uh, so now we go back to Africa and like a, a cloudy blue and purple head uh, shadow king. It, yes. That's, that's what he looks like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he's got uh, big red eyes. Uh, it emerges from the yellow tear. Yeah. And... Uh, for a, for a brief moment, you see him in his somewhat human form. Well, he's got the big blue armor on. Humanoid. Yeah. Humanoid sort of form, an upside down rectangular face, uh, red eyes, and sort of really horns. I really like that look. It's sort of an armored sort of look that he has, but that's his um, physical form. But then he turns into his astral form or spirit form, where he turns into that big, uh, flamey sort of head. Really scary looking, I reckon. And that's when he br- busts out of the tear in time, right? Yeah, so yeah, he, he comes out there and uh, Mijinari's all worried, thinks he should warn the village. And uh, his mates are still like, what are you worrying about? I can't see shit. <laughs> and um, so then that cloudy thing comes yeah. down and that uh, possesses his body. Yeah. And he's sort of floating there for a little bit. And yeah. his mate's like, oh, what's going on? Oh, it's all good. Yeah, he's, these him. boys start laughing. Maybe yeah. they think, oh, wow, he's grown a new power. He can sort of levitate for a bit. So they're just very um, oblivious to what's actually happening. 
So then we cut to the ad break here with uh, Ms. Gennari laughing maniacally. Yeah, doesn't he open his eyes? They're all red and, and his voice has been changed. Really deep sort of rolling voice that uh, Shadow King has. So back from the break, we go to the upper Amazon in Brazil mm-hmm. where there's a steamboat running up the river. Also oh, there in Brazil. Where is Brazil in relation so to Tanzania? Brazil is in <laughs> South America. Right. And Tanzania is all in Africa. All right. So. Two different parts of the world. Two totally different parts of the world, yes. right. Uh, and there's an old pommy captain with a monkey. <laughs> he's taken Wolverine up. He's in his civvies here. He's not in his his Wolverine clothes. Yeah, not he's, in uniform. And he's going up the river looking for Morph. Yeah. And then this is where Wolverine tempts the monkey from the captain yeah. with a peanut. <laughs> hey, monkey, you want a peanut? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, then they pull up to the jetty and uh, Wolverine just disappears straight away. Yeah, he does a Batman. So, yeah, so he is not paying for this very <laughs> uh, Pommy Captain was talking to himself and rather than Wolverine listen to how long the Pommy Captain was going to bang on for, he just puts the monkey on the lamp and takes off out of there. Does the Jimmy. Does the Jimmy. <laughs> and do you think he would pay before he hopped on or is he just saying, oh, I'll pay you when we get there? Yeah, he probably did. It's Wolverine. That's Wolverine. He's pretty tight like that. What's he going to do? It's, no, no, you got to get off and just pop claws and yeah. go, yeah, you want me to get off? <laughs> so now we cut back to Tanzania. And the city of Do- Doma. Doma. Uh, and uh, so this is, we're getting a lot of places now at the bottom of the screen in this app. Because mm. so I, I think it's because there's so many different places that yeah. they have to keep telling you. The different location subtitles. That's yeah. why I wanted to uh, bring up the, the Brazil and the um, Tanzania thing. Because without those subtitles... You could probably assume that maybe they're in the same parts of the mm. country in the same location, but uh, I think those subtitles will maybe put in later just to differentiate the two. Or they could have been planned from the start, but yeah. So in Tanzania, we see Rogue and Storm as they sort of fly down the street and then out into the savannah. Yep. Uh, Storm also says here that uh, she's received a call from a village with an emergency as well as Jean sense from the astral plane rip. So yeah. they're sort of like doubling up on things here. So like Jean's seen it and then she mentions in dialogue, oh yeah, and I also got a call from my village to say that there was a problem. So right. it's it just seems... A converging of plot. It, it seems, uh, I don't know, I just don't like it. It's not, not a fan? No, it's not. A bit too on the nose? It's not one and one equals two. It's like <laughs> one and one is one. It's like... <laughs> Yeah, is it, given, is it given the information twice, like yeah. one explanation is enough sort of thing? Yeah. It's, they could be overdoing it. I didn't like it. <laughs> As they fly out over the mountain, we um, then see the village, and yep. all the villages are on fire. Yeah. So Storm calls upon the rain to quench the flames <laughs> and uh, puts all the fire out. And I've got a note here, Rogue saves cows. Yes. <laughs> she catches the side of a barn. It's going to fall on some cows. So Doing her part. Uh, Storm then runs into a friend, Sharni. Sharni? Is that it? I don't know. I wasn't paying attention to her name. <laughs> Sharni sounds good. I, I don't think, think we're Sh- being culturally insensitive. Yeah. It's Mijnari's mum, right? Yes. Mm. She comes out of the hut to greet her and explain that her son Mijnari is the cause of the issues. Right. Teen rebelliousness. I think not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mijnari set fire to something again. So Rogue says... Uh, Okay, show us where this Mijnari character's at, and Storm and I'll go put a little fear of Storm into him. <laughs> Teach him some manners. Mm. Which I thought was a little bit sexual. <laughs> I didn't pick up on that, but <laughs> anything anything uh, Rogue says could be interpreted that way <laughs> with her sultry voice. So as Rogue goes to fly off, Storm catches her and says that Mijnari is my son. And that's the big... And then the big cut. <gasps> That's the big push in on Rogue and uh, the big aha moment. And that's on the uh, break, I believe. So now we cut to Mijnari and he's in the mountains and he sees that it's raining. So he assumes that Storm has returned as he planned. Mm. And he's sort of like he puts his hand out of the cave and it's rain on his hand and he drinks from it. I mm. thought that was cool. That yeah. They just put that in. Yeah, because I imagine the uh, Shadow King, has his name hasn't been even revealed yet. No. Yet. Nah. Imagine in the Astral Pine, he's not. Very well nourished. 
to eat <laughs> or drink or anything, so maybe s- drinking some water, f- fresh rainwater would be exhilarating for him. But I thought that was a nice touch too, yeah. So Mishnari comes out of the cave now. He stands on the cliff and he says, uh, Stop, godmother to this body, slave to this soul. How will you greet us? Soon, very soon, you will return where you belong, into the service of the Shadow King. <laughs> All right, Shadow King. What, straight up, what did you think of his voice in this? Because as we were watching, we both did a, an impression of a character that we knew, and it was Dorian from The Mask. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It was a really deep role. What was the line you hit? That was Dorian's line. Oh, better than never, you idiot. Yeah. <laughs> Whoa, boss. You okay? Because that's his first line. That's, yeah. that's why I started there. Is the line, was it better than ever, you idiot? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know. I never knew as a kid what he said. So I only remember the follow-up line. The police are looking for the mask. So we're going to give them the mask. <laughs> and that sounds exactly like the Shadow King to me. Exactly. So, yeah, looking back on it, this this is a reason for me to like the episode because it reminds me of the mask. Right. And I really do love deep, rolling, powerful voices. And the Shadow King has a pretty good one. He actually reminds me of the Emperor of the Shia in the coming up episodes, oh, okay. Landra's brother. Yep. I looked it up. They're different actors, but I swear... They are the same sort of guys because they still have that same deep, um, really aggressive sort of laugh. It's like they're laughing right at somebody, just <laughs> kind of like Shao Kahn. But uh, nah, different guys, just same voices. Really cool. See, I didn't make that mask um, reference when I was a kid, mm. but now that was the first thing that came to mind. Yeah. And like I know... Line for line, the whole mask. <laughs> and yeah, that never happened as a kid. I was just like, oh I man. think when you're a kid, you only ever see the characters for what they are and not what they remind you of. As right. an adult, you're just analysing. Like, he just sounds like Dorian from The Mask or blah, 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 blah. I was like, he doesn't sound as good as Apocalypse. But uh, as a kid, you just accept it. And you know, they're not as um, critically thinking <laughs> as we are now. So now we get a fire transition for back to Wolverine in Brazil. Oh, fancy. Which was uh, a new one. And he's entering a bar. Mm. And as he's entering the bar, there's that joke. And I, I don't get the joke. He's like, it was a joke again. Uh, uh, it's, you're going to get the end line and it's like... Oh, what does Horse he say? walks into the bar. No, no, because you're going to get the end of it. And mm. it's like, at, an, at five o'clock, he turns into the bar. And then he's like, oh, you get it. And then everyone just walks out of the bar. It's like... Well, no, I don't get it. These jokes aren't connecting. That's why people are walking out of the bar. Yeah, I, I tried to look it up. I've tried to Google it and everything. I'm like, I, I can't find this joke. What is it? Like, you could have put the end of... It would have been funny if they put the end of, like, a really dirty, dirty joke. joke. <laughs> and then <laughs> people are like, oh, I don't get it. But they're like, oh, man, that was great. <laughs> it just says, honey. <laughs> or he goes... This one's eating my popcorn. They call it the aristocrats. Uh, oh! <laughs> uh, well... That would have been good. Missed opportunity. Just like the war room joke that they never put. And then it's, I don't think it's ever coming. So Wolverine immediately recognizes the barman who is in like a brown shirt and hat. Mm. And he has like a blue undershirt on and he's wearing a red neckerchief. Yeah. <laughs> Very eccentric looking uh, barman. Uh, Wolverine says, spring breaks over, Morph. You're coming with me. Mm. Then Morph comes back to him. I don't think so, old man. I thought you might follow me here. And then... Uh, he morphs back into his sort of Tim Burton-y looking morph, yep, the jaundice the Purple one. eyes, ja- jaundice morph. And uh, Wolverine tells him that he's been in his position and that the professor saved him. Mm. So he's going to save Morph. Yeah. we we'll forcefully save him because Wolverine's marching in at pace. <laughs> he's coming with him. <laughs> yeah. And uh, as he approaches the bar, Morph tips it over on top of Wolverine and just legs it. Yeah, more surprisingly strong bars, big heavy bars like that. I can't imagine they'd be too light. Well, it is in the middle of the, the Brazilian Amazon, so it might not be the best quality bar. Oh, okay. <laughs> I just made out of bamboo. Oh, that that makes sense. <laughs> and then uh, Wolverine cuts through the bar and does a kip up. Yes, you know, I did notice the kip up. I was going to mention it, but you got me there. I do like the the authentic acrobatics when it, then they do pop up. It's a very good technique. And then uh, Wolverine says, you're coming with me one way or another. Dead or alive, you're coming with me. And there was no claw draw there. I thought he was going to get the claws out again. Because mm. yeah, that was sort of put the button on it. Yeah, that's to put the button on the sign. 
So uh, more of questions. Why does Wolverine want to take him back? Mm. Just to go bowling? <laughs> go bowling? And then, okay, here we go. <laughs> Morph, morphs into Jane yes. and says, or maybe it's love you're missing. When I'm with you, all I can think about is how much I'm in love with Cyclops. Oh, what a heart-wrenching line to say to Wolverine, man. But uh, Morph knows how to push his buttons. Is this what you took out of that? Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I did. That's what I did take out. What was the subtext that you picked up on this? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's pretty obvious what Wolverine's been doing with Morph. <laughs> no, no. That's why he wants him back, so obvious. Oh, that's so terrible. I don't even want to think about that. <laughs> Maybe Morph the prankster was always turning into Gene and encouraging this sort of flotation. So maybe Wolverine's been led astray. That's that's why he's always after Gene. Maybe maybe Morph the, the prankster has been se- had seen Wolverine hitting on Gene and just for fun he turns into Gene just to fuel the fire some more. And that's probably what's caused this whole rift between Wolverine and Cyclops and Gene. But I really don't think it's the... <laughs> He's not threatening Morph with his life to change into Gene for the night. <laughs> the You're coming with me <laughs> on the boat in the room I rented. Oh, I really don't want to think about it. I don't want to talk about it. So, but, yeah, this this line just confuses and startles Wolverine. And it's enough uh, Morph to have enough time to escape from the bar. Yeah, it breaks Wolverine. He's down on his hands and knees. Then he then he gets like a berserker rage. He's like ah, and he gets the claws out, fires up, boom, first claw draw, mm-hmm. and then uh, crashes through the wall in pursuit of morph and mm. screaming into the distance, running and screaming into the forest. That's one angry man. <laughs> Imagine if he caught him. <laughs> <laughs> so- you mother. F- <laughs> So back to Africa now, where um, Shani explains to Rogue the story of Mijinari mm-hmm. and how she is his mother. Mm. So it's like uh, when he was born, he wasn't breathing, so Storm gave him CPR, and then he was okay. Yeah, I didn't get it when they kept calling him mother because as a kid, was, I didn't know what fully meant what it fully meant godmother. I don't know what it meant. Mm. I didn't know it was like the backup mum essentially. Yeah. But in the in the uh, show, they only explained that it was he, she was not the mother because he had an actual mother, but she just resuscitated him. But everyone's saying she's or she's always saying he's my son or that's my mother. I thought like, I didn't get that. No. I was like, it still so- doesn't make sense to me now. Like, <laughs> I understand if his mum had died, yes, she would have called him mum. But she's right there. Yeah, mm. the maybe, mum's right there. Maybe in the comics, sh- she died and. Storm's technically the, technically the mother or godmother in charge now, but it, to me it'd make more sense if she was like an aunt. Exactly, that's what I said. <laughs> yeah, if they called it Auntie Storm, Aunt Storm, you know, it made, there's the stronger sort of connect because they're not even related. No, not even related. It's just just some just some mate or whatever. But anyway, moving on away from that. So yeah, she says that Storm looked after him when and as he grew and cared for him, and then because uh, she was. Sick after the birth. Yeah, so they wasn't just looked well. Looked after him a fair bit. Mm. Should yeah. mention that the baby that she's resuscitating looks way older <laughs> than a newborn. Yeah. That kid's four. That's a big baby. Carried me full term plus eight months. <laughs> you know, like, definitely. Toddler Mishnari looks younger than baby Mishnari. But anyway, let's not talk about the size of babies. Shani also says that about a year ago, Mishnari developed special skills, yeah. which is his super speed. Mm-hmm. And uh, yesterday, he changed. <laughs> he changed. So uh, Rogue says, that's when Gene said the astral plane tour opened somewhere around here. Mm-hmm. It's, again, it's like... Oh, very, very, it's very on the nose, isn't yeah, it? Real, just... real obvious. You've got to try and remember this is for kids. They've so got to drive the point home. But Ash- the rest of them aren't like this. No, they're not. There's like, a lot of hand holding in this yeah. episode. Open wide, here comes the exposition. So then uh, Mijnari just appears in the village, just right behind him. Yes, which was, um, he just appeared maybe, I was just looking at it, did we miss a scene? Did something <laughs> get cut for time of him just running in? Is this suddenly Mijnari? 
<laughs> Suddenly Shadow King. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly Shadow King. Hello, Storm. How are you? But he just sort of he's just there. There's no sound effect showing. Zoop! He's arrived. Which it still works because it explains that he's really fast, and maybe the Shadow King is amplifying his powers. But to me, it's established that he he you can see him running. He just doesn't suddenly appear. Doesn't suddenly appear without a sound effect. It feels as though something's missing because when he does appear, it's in full close up. You don't yeah. see him arms, legs, whatever, full body shot. He's just full in close up, which they only go in close when the dialogue scenes are happening mm. and not an introduction to the character regardless of how suddenly he appears so it feels like something's missing here yeah exactly yeah straight away she knows that this is shadow king and uh shiny wants to know what has happened to her son <laughs> and rogue adds that the professor sent the shadow king to the and then interrupts him astral plane astral plane so yeah there there's a backstory here with the x-men and the shadow king mm. but, where it's sort of learning it in dribs and draps. Yeah, it's sort of led to believe that Professor X and the Shadow King threw down hmm. and Professor X kicked his ass right into the astral plane, which is something I would have liked to have seen in a flashback, you yeah. know. Shadow King could get really pissed and say, It was your Professor X that sent me to the astral plane. And they show all the vision of Professor X going into into psychic battle mode and he gets big armor and, and Shadow King's beating on him and and Professor X could kick him into the mountains. Like, why not show us that? It would have made the episode better. Would it would it give us that sting? It would have been really cool, great visuals, but instead it's just all done with lines and sometimes not explained at all. It's just what Shadow King wants with Storm, right? Yeah. So Storm tells the Shadow King to leave the boy as she is the one that he wants. Mm-hmm. And uh, then he says, he agrees with her and yes. tells her to meet him on the mountain before he just runs away at the super speed. Yeah, meet me on the mountain. And so Storms tells Rogue to stay there and help the others, and she tells Shani that Mishnari will be all right. Mm. So Rogue reminds her that even the Professor had trouble with the Shadow King, yeah, and that she should come along to help. Mm-hmm. And Storm refuses and believes that uh, it, if she comes, the Shadow King might hurt Mishnari. Yeah. And so then she flies off towards the mountain. And then uh, Rogue says, And the Shadow King could harm you. Don't suppose I'm about to allow that. And uh, she flies off chasing Storm. Mm. So Rogue's, it's quite often that Rogue and Storm are always hanging out or always seem to be paired up in these episodes. I think maybe because they're the two flying characters. Yeah, two flying chicks. They're the two uh, competent chicks in the team. Mm. There's Jubilee and Very Jean. Very strong. Jubilee and Jean are the fainting no good ones that aren't really great, they're really uh uh, contribute much to the team, so they're the real strong powerhouses, the strong female characters. So it makes sense that they're always teaming together, and I like that Rogue's got Storms back in this. But just with uh, Shadow King's motivation, I think I really like the idea that he can sort of amplify the other mutants' powers. I don't know if it's proven or not, or it's just something that I'm bringing to it. Like Mizunari seems faster when he's with the Shadow King, and maybe when Shadow King's in Storm, he will have. Uh, an even greater control of her powers and right. it'll be an amplified sort of thing. Why else would he want to control the weather? It doesn't seem like a, a great, powerful superpower no. of all the mutants to take over. So now this is another part I've got. Like they, it, it just goes Stormhead straight up to the mountain to confront the Shadow King. So yeah. there's no there's no cutaway. Remember last time, like last episode, I was saying, why are we going back to the hospital where Storm was? Yes. And you were saying it breaks it up? Yes. This definitely needed that here. Mm. Like she's talking to Rogue, you can't come with me. I'm going to go alone. Rogue's like, no, nah, I'm coming. And then they just show that. It feels as it was a good point to have the B, yeah. the B storyline in there. But um, because there wasn't, I think there's only one more cutaway to the B storyline, yeah. and that wraps that's it, it up. So to put that in there would been. And you've also got the C storyline as well, which is the one you get at the end with the sh- the um, Savage Land. Yeah, but that's more or less. It's got the big reveal at the end, so you can't use too much of that. But uh, yeah, I understand what you mean. He goes, oh, okay. Why not just take the powers right then and there in the village yeah. or lure them up so it's not a lot, lot of back and forth and wasted motion. So, yeah, it is a bit of a, I don't know, wasted beat in the storyline. So the cat, Shadow King says, I thought we might reminisce about old times together. And uh, Storm tells him to leave her son. Yes. They're still going on with this son thing. Mm. 
It's and not going to stop. <laughs> he agrees and says that um, as long as she agrees to a small exchange. Mm. And then uh, Rogue flies in here and says, don't try anything cute, you low-life street thief. <laughs> <laughs> Who's she talking to here? Like, hang on. She, I thought she was talking to Mishnari. I that thought she was a little bit mean. I thought she was talking to Storm. <laughs> Hang on, we don't know that yet. <laughs> we don't know who's talking to who. It's all very confusing. And why is she calling the guy from the astral plane? <laughs> the <laughs> street thief. Yeah, why is he the street thief? Street, street rat. I mean, uh, it makes sense just thinking about it now because this is a large chunk of dialogue. And when they're at the village, it's a large chunk of dialogue. Without yeah. the change of location, it would have just been massive just talking. And um, there would have been no way around it. I think they're having it. Location change just breaks it up a little bit. The Shadow King explains here that now he's back from the astral plane where he was banished by the professor, mm. he will need some assistance rebuilding his empire. Mm. And he needs you, Storm. And the Shadow King says here, agree to serve as my host body with all your delicious powers <laughs> and I shall free the boy. Delicious powers. He must be really into this, the weather powers. <laughs> so Storm agrees as long as the Shadow King promises not to hurt Mishnari. Mm. Agreed. Uh, so he's, Rogue steps in here and tries to stop her by telling her uh, not to throw a life away. Mm. And in return, uh, Storm throws Rogue away into the air and yeah. out of sight. Really big throw from Storm. Maybe she throws her up and somehow the wind catches her and takes her far, far away. But yeah, I'm thinking maybe if they had uh, hinted at that Storm had a plan of getting rid of the Shadow King, then maybe Rogue would be a little bit more resistance. Resistant yeah. to the idea, but we don't find out till later what Storm has in mind. So the Shadow King emerges from Mishnari's body in like a purpley blue burp. Yes. <laughs> and uh, Rogue flies back in here and tries to like hit the smoke. Yeah, she tries to wave it away because all she sees is smoke. Maybe she could get rid of him that way. As it's like transferring into Storm. Mm. And then the Shadow King is now in Storm. And he's also still very unhappy about being locked away in the astral plane. Mm. But he feels that uh, Storm's body, with Storm's body, no one will be able to attack him. Then he says, Xavier, I have won. Xavier, I have won. And then we go to an ad break. So we come back from the break and the Shadow King is going on. He says he's going to rule Cairo as never before. <laughs> it's like, we, they haven't even talked about Cairo yet. It's like, <laughs> what? Well, Cairo has been ruled by a lot of people. The yeah. Egyptians, Apocalypse. <laughs> How are you going to top Apocalypse's reign? Tell me that, Shadow He's, King. He, he can make it rain. <laughs> Apocalypse can enslave an entire nation. He can make it rain. <laughs> he can make it windy. He can make it windy. Apocalypse wouldn't be too happy about that. Uh, the Shadow King says, With my mind and these powers, every criminal in the city will have to work for me. That's definitely a Dorian Tyreo. <laughs> <laughs> Dorian Tyreo. <laughs> so Rogue tells Mignari to head to safety and leave it to her to, and she takes off to try and get Storm. Mm. Uh, Rogue flies up next to Storm, and uh, so now Storm's occupied by Shadow King, so she's got the deep voice, mm. and uh, Shadow King says, Storm is occupied at present. Kindly leave us before you anger her. <laughs> And then I uh, sort of hits Rogue with a bit of bolt of lightning. Yep. And uh, Rogue says, all right, all right, tough guy, no more kid gloves. And she removes one of the gloves. Has she said no more kid gloves before? I don't think so. I don't think so. I'll have to keep in mind because I swear that's, I've heard that line before. And as uh, Storm is flying away from Rogue, he says, I understand your body is rather crowded at the moment. I prefer this one. That's sort of foreshadowing what we're going to see in the yeah, future. Yeah, a little nod there. I like that um, that uh, Shadow King has those sort of uh, powers to be able to detect what's going on in others' body. I thought that was a really cool foreshadow, that one. And Shadow King. Storm seems to take control again now from the Shadow King, and the red eyes disappear, and we yeah. see Storm's blue eyes again. There's battle going on. And she says, Rogue, no, he will destroy you. Mm-hmm. And uh, the Shadow King takes over again. He says, no, I won't. Come close. (laughs) And then uh, he sort of summons a twister to grab Rogue and uh, throws her out across the land where she's caught by Mijnari. Yeah, he gets her in a real good twister here. She's really thrown asunder and she's, 
and uh, Mijnari goes, whoop, 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 catches underneath her. But he just falls back, and he has a line. I think it's, I'm fast, but I'm still not that strong. I like that bit. That was pretty cute. <laughs> uh, Rogue is not happy that Mijnari is here to help mm. and won't go away. <laughs> but <piss> uh, <laughs> Because the Shadow King has his mother, he feels he needs to help. Mm. I like that he's stepping up. He's going to yeah. use his powers for... Great power comes great responsibility, and also to to help uh, get his godmother back. I think he'd make a pretty good X Men for some reason. I really like that he's got that sense of duty and wants to really step up and help, regardless of people saying, "No, you're too young. You just got you'll just get God again." He's got that sort of stubborn heroism, kind of like Jubilee, but I feel as though he could do way more yep. to help the team than Jubilee. So now we cut back to Wolverine as he's still running through the Amazon. Ah, yes. And then he suddenly falls straight down a mine shaft. Yeah. And then uh, when he gets up, he's like, who took away the jungle? <laughs> I like that line. That was a good one. And uh, so lucky he fell down that mine shaft because you'll never guess who else is down there. <laughs> Morph. So Wolverine has another claw draw here. And uh, Morph says he must have hit a nerve. Yeah. Then uh, Wolverine says... So you made me mad. It happens all the time. <laughs> I like that the Wolverine's aware that he's got a really short fuse. That was pretty funny. And then he says, you should see me in line at the post office. <laughs> I think that's a little bit of a writer, writer influence yep. coming through. Because who's ever that pissed at a post office? Julia Leewald is. Yeah. <laughs> and no kids care about that. They're like, why, why do you get angry at the post office? Mm. I don't get that. Her and her, Julia Leewald, Wolverine, and Ned Flanders. <laughs> they, they don't like the post office. They must be really shit in America. Over here, they're fine. I'm never mad at the post office. Uh, as Morph is walking towards Wolverine, he says that his body heals fast, but when he is through with him, his mind will never recover. Mm. And this is where Morph morphs into, he goes into Deadpool, then to Omega Red, then into Maverick, and then back to himself. Yeah. Those scenes are always really cool, especially yeah. when they're morphing into other characters that aren't in the story just yet. If they're cameos, like Deadpool, he never shows up. No. Not at all, just in uh, little Morph cameos. But turning into Maverick and then Omega Red, I really like that he can... Take, take the form of someone who has uh, gotten into an altercation with Wolverine. A really sort of a really good mind fuck the way that they, they play on, on that sort of thing. So Wolverine says that he's prepared to risk it. And, uh, Morph to get the says, biscuit. <laughs> and Morph says, I wouldn't if I were you. And then he morphs into Wolverine. Yeah. And then he's in the costume. Mm. And then, uh, ah, yes, that's cool. And then uh, he has Claude Draw here. And... Uh, Wolverine says, You might look like me, but you don't fight like me. And so they're, they're fighting a bit, and then he cuts Morph's claws off. Yeah. Now, what part <laughs> of Morph is that? See, I don't know. That's what I always thought. I mean, I figure it's like, that would still hurt because it's still yeah. a part of you. I looked at it like in, in Terminator 2 when the T-1000 gets his, his claw shot off and it falls onto the ground, he's still, it's still a part of him. Mm. If he loses that, he needs to get it back. But if it's a, if he's a shapeshifter, he could have just lost a finger or a toe. Or a, Didn't the same thing happen to Mystique in the first... In, ex, the, in the first uh, X-Men yeah. movie, she's, wolf, wolf, the Wolverines are and fighting. And she screams nah! when that happens, but it doesn't seem to affect her nah, much either. It's more or less her being afraid. Yeah. Yeah, because they don't explain that. I imagine if they, if, if we because once it's gone, it's gone. Mm. I don't, it makes sense if he, like, if it's a, a finger or whatever. Because then I guess you got the older question about the clothes. Like, if he rips his clothes, is that hurting him as well? Mm. It's, like a... it's, a, it's a whole kettle of fish that's best not open. But I always thought if, if he didn't collect those drop claws, he's losing X amount of percent. He's from got his two body. fingers missing. Either that or he's, like, a little bit shorter. Oh, yeah. Or he's just losing. Bits and bits and bits. If he keeps losing um, claws or horns or whatever and doesn't collect them back up to absorb back into his body, he's a little bit smaller. That's what I thought with the T-1000. So if he lost his hook, he's lost a part of him and his mass is coming down. So this is the part of the B plot that sort of seems to go downhill for me now. All right. Because Morph then transforms into a panther. A panther. Attack Wolverine. <laughs> like, oh boy. I mean, yeah, you've got your entire library yeah. of villains in the Marvel. You got all big cats. <laughs> you turn into on, a big man. cat. <laughs> Did you 
you turn into the Hulk or Juggernaut. Yeah. There are big mutants you could turn into Slab. Gorgeous George could come back. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but yeah, he turns into a panther. So he's fighting with the panther and he's like, oh, uh, the X-Men can help you. And then uh, he sort of breaks away and then he morphs into a rhino. Mm. And he charges at Wolverine, knocks him into the wall. And then he transforms into Sabretooth. And it's like, why didn't you do that in the first place? Because that was Start ace with Sabretooth. But I like that um, they save Sabretooth um, till that point. So when he starts talking, there's, there's the gravitas of a relationship between him and Sabretooth. Yep. Rather than Morph turning into just a big thug Sabretooth to fight, he turns into the big thug Sabretooth to mind fuck him some more. And uh, as serious as this scene was, as soon as Sabretooth Morph starts talking, I'm I'm having a good time because he's got such an entertaining voice. Yeah. I can't tell you what he says, but I'm sure you can tell me what Sabretooth says. Well, because Wolverine's line was, the X-Men can help you, he says, without Xavier, there are no X-Men. Without Xavier, there are no X-Men. <laughs> And then uh, Wolverine upcuts Sabretooth and now uh, pops claws either side of his face. Mm. That was pretty cool. It could be a nod to the comics because I think that's how Wolverine lobotomizes Sabretooth. He does oh, yeah. that and then the third claw goes straight through his brain. But that's I think that's later on in other comics. But uh, it could have been a nod, but it's, either way, it's a really cool bit. And then uh, Sabretooth grabs Wolverine, throws him across the mine again, and then he morphs back into Morph and says... You never listen. I have to get through this by myself! Yeah, this is like the first... This is like the only time of the episode where we uh, see Morph as himself. He doesn't have the Tim Burton look. Yeah. And then he runs down the mine shaft into the darkness. Yeah, he morphs into classic innocent Morph. And that's when it's just like you think that that one is sort of taking over for a little bit. Jaundice Morph's a little bit tired from all the fighting and he's going to rest for a bit. But uh, Innocent Morph really says, I have to fi- figure this out for myself and runs away. So you can tell not one is completely in charge with the evil Morph and Innocent Morph, which I think is just a really good conflict between those two for, yep. the, for the body of Morph. So I like that bit. It was good and he runs off by himself. Uh, Wolverine, while he's still writhing in pain on the ground, says, When you're ready, I'll be there for you. The X-Men will be there. And then we cut back to Africa and uh, Storm is fighting with the Shadow King in her mind and uh, he warns her not to fight back. Here we're getting flashbacks like Storm pickpocketing as a kid and then Shadow King takes the wallet and he's standing over in, in his humanoid form. Pretty badass gets looking. Gets big and everything. Gets yeah. big and everything. And, but uh, yeah, it's just yeah, you don't get to see much of what he does. No. Besides just run a bunch of street street thieves. Yeah, this is where he's in that humanoid sort of form that yeah. we were talking about with before. With the horns and the claws, yeah. And he has like Storm as the young Storm in his hand. Yeah. And uh, he says that uh, she cannot stop him. And there Storm says, I may not be able to stop you, but I can destroy you by destroying us. <laughs> I'd rewrite that. Surely you've got time to make that make sense. Come on, Julia, you're better than that. So this is where Storm starts flying higher and higher up. It's exactly the same as what Rogue did in Days of Future Past. Mm. And because uh, it's the same ride, remember? Yeah. What? When did when did Rogue do that? Who'd she be? Oh, the um, Days of Future Past Part Two. Yeah, when the fire bird was coming after her. Yes. It was yeah. Pyro. Was that number two or number one? I can't that was remember. Number two, I think. It was. Yeah, they were at they were at uh, the place, and then he in Washington. Yeah. yeah. It wasn't a similar similar episode, but uh, yeah. It's a go-to move when you're trying to beat somebody and you can fly. Yes. So as she gets up into the stratosphere and uh, the Shadow King can't breathe, Mm. so he sort of starts to emit like this purple light Mm. and then uh, she falls back to Earth. And then uh, Rogue catches Storm and she's falling and he brings her to Mijinari. And uh, this is that massive exposition scene, isn't it? Yeah. Shadow King's flailing up in their stratosphere and now they're trying to figure out how to... Bring him down, and it's just talking and talking and talking. So Storm tells Mijinari to run away, and her and Rogue will battle the Shadow King, who seems to have taken the form of like a large red spiral in the sky. Mm. And uh, this is like happening behind them as they're talking. Yeah. And then Mijinari explains that the Shadow King first appeared from the yellow rip in the side of the mountain. Yep. 
and it's really small now, but yesterday it was as big as the mountain. Mm. And this is where we find out that Mijinari is the only one that can see the entrance to the yes. astral plane. And so he takes off to sort of lead the Shadow King back into the tear. Mm. And uh, Mijinari calls the Shadow King over to him, and uh, which is now back into like his black, blue, purpley faced sort of form. <laughs> He's taken his spirit form back. He's regathered himself. And then Storm calls upon lightning and thunder here to, to do nothing. Mm. And then Rogue also picks up a big boulder and throws it at Shadow King that does nothing as well. Like, mm. they still don't... Why are they doing this still? Like, they this gotta, is the end of the episode. they got to try something. <sighs> so, but in that whole thing, they've come up with the plan. We've got to lure him back into the astral plane. So Mijnari steps up and says he's the best man for the job here because he can sort of go in there. And he's really backing himself and really taking charge of the situation. So... Yeah, he's waving over to uh, waving over the Shadow King. So come and get me, you overgrown whatever he calls him, because that's that just made sense to me. Like, why wouldn't Shadow King just go straight back into Storm? Yeah. So Mishnari really had to step up here and say, "You come get me," and uh, it eventually won over the Shadow King. All right, Storm, I'm going to make you pay now because I'm going to get Mishnari back and torture the crap out of him or whatever. But Mishnari tears ass away and just heads straight for the mountain. Yeah, he heads straight for the tear in the astral plane here, mm-hmm. and uh, the Shadow King's in hot pursuit. Then he runs straight into the astral plane, and the, the Shadow King comes straight through with him. Mm. And then inside, it looks like Mario Kart Rainbow Road. <laughs> that was my note as well. <laughs> that was dead set all at once. It looks like Rainbow Road with a couple of membranes floating around in there. But I should mention that went once uh, Mishnari's being chased by Shadow King, you get some really cool shots. Of Mishnari speed, he's running real fast, fire's going behind him, and you can see Shadow King just lurking behind him like the T-Rex in Jurassic Park when he's chasing after the Jeep. And uh, Shadow King's laughing the whole time, which I thought was really cool. It's like he's just supremely confident, supremely arrogant. He's just he knows he's gonna get him. So that's just setting up for the fall here. But yeah, we enter in uh, the last course of Super Mario Kart 64. When they're in the uh, Rainbow Road. It's lucky that there were roads there, otherwise Mishnari would have been screwed. <laughs> so, uh, Rogue and Storm are outside trying to find the the, the tear and they can't because they can't see it. Yeah, they got shut out. Yeah, and like Storm's like clawing at the ground and Rogue's just punching friggin' rocks trying to find like, oh, yeah. come on. They're, they're desperate, man. They've got to do something. And then uh, Mishnari's hand appears, pops out. Mm. And then uh, they managed to pull him out just in time before the tear seals itself and the Shadow King's trapped inside. Mm, yeah, in that whole bit inside Rainbow Road, uh, you hear um, uh, Storm's voice repeating, repeating over and over. We must drive the Shadow King back into the astral plane before it reseals itself. Reseals itself. Reseals itself. Reseals itself. That's really driving home the point, what's Mishnari going to be doing? And yeah, he gets on the road out the door, saved, and that's the end of the Shadow King. He's trapped. He just fucked himself. And that's, yeah, pretty much the end of that. Rogue and Storm fly off into the sunset, and then Rogue comments to Storm that she has one hell of a son. Yeah, they wrap that up pretty quick. Yeah, and Storm thinks that, uh, wonders if they'll get any word on where the professor is. Mm. Storm says she isn't sure but uh she knows that they were in his thoughts today mm. i strongly doubt that yeah so do i <laughs> they they're really putting professor on a higher pedestal than he needs to be i'm sure he's thinking man it's fucking cold under all this snow <laughs> he never thinks of them anyway <laughs> shit he's a villain according to you so then we cut to antarctica where mm-hmm. we see the professor and magneto they crawl out of the snow and uh so yeah the Guess that avalanche wasn't too bad after it all. It wasn't anyway. a heavy avalanche. Who cares? It's like, oh yeah, small avalanche. <laughs> so they white C4 charge in the avalanche. So they stand up and they see that there's a rainforest in Antarctica. Mm-hmm. Uh, Magneto explains that this is the savage land. A valley hidden in perpetual mist, created eons ago for a purpose long forgotten. So yeah, someone made it for something some time ago. <laughs> Very convenient. At this point, the professor realizes that he can actually stand and that he can walk. I oh, know, your first point, they stand up. Yeah. They don't <laughs> realize that they stand up either. No. So they're just having this, this big long chat about the savage land. And he's like, my legs. And then uh, Magneto tries to use his powers, realizes they're gone. Yeah, he goes, what would cause this? He throws the hands out to the side for a uh, force field and nothing happens. And then, of course, the professor, 
oh, it's all mine. Oh, no. <laughs> and uh, the professor questions Magneto about the Savage Land mm. and what he knows about it. Magneto thought he knew a lot more, but uh, nothing has ever affected his mutant power like this before. So he's not really sure what's going on. Mm. And this is when we see uh, another TV transition to Sinister's <laughs> Lair. Yeah. And uh, he's watching the two of them on a monitor before uh, he presses a button. And then uh, two pterodactyls with people riding on them appear. And uh, so they, they're flying at Magneto and the professor. And uh, one of them snatches Magneto and his talons before the uh, professor sort of falls over and then takes off. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> professor... Has a boomerang. Yeah. <laughs> Suddenly boomerang. Suddenly boomerang. <laughs> Where the fuck did yeah. a boomerang come from? Maybe the missing animation that oh fell out of the, God. the pterodactyl rider's pocket. Oh, man. <laughs> like, what the hell is going on here? <laughs> Suddenly boomerang. Like, he could have just picked up a rock. Why do it need to be a boomerang? It doesn't even come back. Like, <laughs> it could have been a stick or a rock or anything. Mm. Why does it have to be a boomerang? I think, I think why not, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, he throws this boomerang at the pterodactyl, hits the guy, not mm. the pterodactyl, and the pterodactyl <laughs> drops it, yeah. drops Magneto. Yeah. And then Magneto falls into the, a river. Yep. And then uh, the professor's like, oh, no, jumps in after him. And he's sort of holding his head above water before they both get washed over a waterfall <laughs> to be continued. And you mentioned that all, every time we're in the Savage Land, it literally ends with a cliffhanger. That's right. Or falling off a cliff or something. Literal cliffhangers all season long. <laughs> <laughs> and that is the end of that, thank God. And that's the end of that chapter. Ugh. We're going to make it. Now, I, I, I did a little bit of research. I won't say research. I looked at Wikipedia here. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Professor Xavier's ability to walk while in the savage land never explained in the show. Though in the comics, which I really, really dig, his body was crippled due to injury sustained in the astral plane, meaning his physicality was fine, but his mutant-powered mind would tell his body he was crippled. Uh, coincidentally, right. he, that happened when he was fighting the Shadow King. Right. Why didn't they tie that into the rest of the that episode? That would have made it heaps better. It would have explained it would have explained everything. And you could have done that in the little homage of Shadow King versus Professor. Professor. Not the, not homage, just a little flashback. flashback. A little flashback of Shadow mm -hmm. King versus Professor. You could have Shadow King uh narrating the whole thing. Now while I was lost into the astral plane, I did not Xavier didn't get away unscathed, I beat his ass and now he can't walk <laughs> and they could explain that and and it could have added so much more to the savage land losing the powers that's was why he can he can now walk because that thing's been turned off uh but that's just how it happened in the comics in the in the series i can't remember how they explain how professor lost his ability to walk because it's clearly not um physical damage because he's walking around fine in the shadow land in the uh savage land yeah. So we'll have to wait till the later episodes if it ever is explained how uh, Professor Xavier lost the ability to walk because in the movies it's different, in the comics it's different, and I'm sure in the series it's uh, different. But yeah, just really drives the point home that this episode needed a flashback fight scene between Shadow King and Professor yeah. X. Would have made it cool, would have explained a lot, and uh, definitely would have bumped up the rating for me in this one. And, and uh, yeah... Watching it now, it feels like a bit of a flatline mediocre, mediocre episode where the B show is B plot line is stealing the show. Mm -hmm. So that's what I thought. What did you think? <laughs> Why was I this? I think I've left all mine in there. But <laughs> I just don't like. It's, it's not a not fan. a strong episode. Not a strong it's, episode. It's nothing's interested me. It's yeah. It's not badass. It's not cheesy, funny, mm. and it's not cool. It's just one of those that really it's. Doesn't deliver on on anything. No, <laughs> nothing. <laughs> was, it, hey, was it worse than Captive Hearts? I didn't enjoy Captive Hearts, but I would have preferred Captive Hearts to this. Wow, you're that's madness. <laughs> <laughs> that is madness. So I prefer this one because there's like op an opportunity to be better. I in Captive Hearts, I can't see salvaging that monster, but I, I can I can understand that. 
So what's your favourite part of this? Favourite part of this? I mean, I really like Shadow King. I really like his voice. So I would say just that chase scene when right. Shadow King's really pissed <laughs> at Mijnari and he's chasing him down. It's just a woof, 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 going through, tearing up all the grass and he's really a massive looming presence coming up behind Mijnari. It's like Mijnari's in the foreground and the entire background is just this big ball of Shadow King. Yep. I thought that was really cool. I really wish that the writers had given him Shadow King some bigger lines, some bigger boss moments because... I think this had a lot of potential to be cool, but just wasn't. But uh, yeah, that was my favorite bit—the big chase scene. Did you? Did you even have a favorite bit? With, it was when, hard. when the credits rolled. That yeah, was your favorite yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I guess if I had to pick one, I'd say when Morph was morphing into all the different people. That's yeah, cool. that's, that's, cool. that's always cool, and that, that's that's a cool bit too. I mean, you could argue that all oh, your, your what you really took out of this episode was just the B storyline, Wolverine mm. and Morph, and. There's no reason they could have had a a whole episode of just Wolverine and Morph. I yep. mean, that's super interesting. Would have preferred that. I, I would have preferred if they bounced... Uh, they could have done Savage Land as the B story and Shadow King as the A story and just gone off the Shadow King versus Professor X. Yep. That could have been a separate episode to this one, whatever it takes, and just have Wolverine tracking Morph in the jungle as his own episode. I reckon that would have been cool. Did you have a favorite quote? Uh, the, None are jumping out for me. I just I put the Wolverine one says, "So you made me mad." Happens all the time when you should see me at the post office. So that's, <laughs> that's the only one I put. Yeah. Well, I I had um I'm fast, but I'm still not that strong. Yep. To me, that's the line I remember most from the episode uh, as a kid and as an adult. But um, that just tells you how um how uh the Shadow King's dialogue was a missed opportunity. I mean, usually when you got the deep booming voice. Sinister, Apocalypse, or or any other big tough character. Normally, or the the central figure of the episode usually is the villain. If they don't have a cool line, and they got that cool voice, it's, I think it's a missed opportunity. So yeah, I should also mention here that there was no Cyclops, Gambit, or Jubilee at all in the all episode, right. and there was very limited Gene and Beast. Yeah, it was pretty barren for characters. So yeah. you're either on the missionary train or you weren't. <laughs> So, how do you rate this? Uh, straight up, it's a five. It's pretty average for me. I wouldn't go as low as uh, Captive Hearts, or it's it's not a really low-ranked episode for me. It's just pretty average, and it's, there's not a lot in there that could... Well, I've, I've, I've said what I've wanted for mm. this episode. Yeah, same. So, I, I really can't explain it any further, so I'll just say it's a five, because it's pretty, pretty mediocre, right in the middle. I gave it a four. Gave it a four. That's fair. All right, it's time for tally time. You got some claw drawers for me, Brooks, because I have stopped counting them. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. I'm always counting. Yeah, excellent. Uh, we got four this week four for this week. claw drawers. So mm -hmm. plus the 13 we've already got this season. We're up to 17, and all up we're up to 61. Uh, there was no bubs again. We're still bubless. Mm -hmm. And uh, Gene didn't faint, <laughs> and Beast didn't quote anyone. Yeah, so, I, yeah, it was yeah. all just Mizunawi shit. <laughs> I didn't hear any stolen sound effects either. I mean, maybe because I've stopped listening and there's no Sentinels. They're the only sound effects that I could hear. But yeah, it's it's pretty much, uh, yeah, nothing much to report on this one. Nope. All right, it's time for the social media shout outs. Rate and subscribe to us on iTunes and Podbean. You can also find us on Podcast Addict, Pocket Casters and now Stitcher. If you're on iTunes, give us a star rating so we can have the average. I want to see how many stars we're worth. Like and share our page on Facebook at Generation X-Men. Share us to any X-Men fans who'd like to hear two Australians bang on about mutants for an hour. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Gen X Men Pod for some behind-the-scenes photos, videos, and Meme Monday. Or you can contact us via Facebook IM or by email, GenerationXMenPodcast at gmail.com. So, Brooksy, what's up for us next week? Uh, next episode is number 17, season 2, episode 4, Red Dawn. Red Dawn, I'm looking forward to this one. Yes, this got, one's going to be a lot better. This one is like, it's going to be the breath mint after the uh, bad dinner, if Ooh, that yeah. makes sense. But uh, <laughs> I'm big into uh, Omega Red, and, uh, and, and of course he's a Wolverine villain, So, and I love Russians. So this has got a lot of the ingredients that I like in an X-Men uh, episode already. And I remember this is a heavily rewatched episode for me. If I'm flicking through, I just find Red Dawn. That's the one I'm watching. <laughs>
All right, that's it from us here at Generation X, man. Hope you've had as much fun listening as we have had talking. Wherever you are in the world, thank you for your time and attention. Next week, we've got Red Dawn with Breakdown, Tally Time, and Claw Draw. Like the Terminator, we'll be back, and we look forward to your company then. Thanks for hosting, Brooksy. No worries, Bender. Take it easy, mate. No worries. See you, mate. See ya. Bye-bye.